ocean. How was I to know that the Western barbarians had lost their hearts and reason? With a hundred kinds of oppressive laws, they mistreat us Chinese. This anonymous Chinese poet, you don't know who it was, none of the poems that you see today carved into the barrack walls or signed by any particular person, uh, but this anonymous Chinese poet speaks to us from a hundred years ago. And his poem reminds us that in 1882, during a time of economic recession and intense anti-Chinese sentiment and violence, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred Chinese laborers from coming to the United States. Now this was the first time in US history that a specific group was excluded on the basis of race or national origin. It was passed against the Chinese. But in subsequent years, there were other laws that were passed to restrict immigration of Japanese, Korean, South Asians, and Filipinos. And also in the 1920s uh, to restrict immigration from Southern and Eastern European countries. So back then when this poem was written and during this time of anti-immigrant uh, legislation, immigration was a complicated and a contentious matter. And it still is today. Many states like Arizona and Alabama have passed laws authorizing local police to arrest and detain people that they suspect of being here illegally, which could lead to racial profiling and the targeting of particularly Mexican immigrants. These laws also make it a crime for anyone to transport to harbor, to hire, or to rent to an undocumented immigrant. Now the intent of these state laws is to make life so miserable that these immigrants would just self-deport. That's a new term that was just coined by um, Governor Mitt Romney. That's his solution to the problem of illegal immigration today. So in a sense, history is repeating itself because these exactly the same kind of things that were happening against Chinese and Asian immigrants 100 years ago. And the anti-immigrant movement is as strong as it was then today. So as our country continues to suffer the worst economic crises since the Great Depression, Americans are again blaming immigrants for taking away jobs, for not assimilating into American society, and for being a drain on the American economy. They're being scapegoated and blamed for the economic situation in America. Next slide. Now, if we could just oppose this anti-immigrant viewpoint with the more popular understanding that America is a nation of immigrants built by immigrants. The story of the 12 million immigrants, mainly Europeans, who passed through Ellis Island, entered the United States, and overcame hardships to achieve the American dream is one of the most enduring and most often told chapter of American history. That's what we all grew up with, believing and understanding to be our um, history as a nation of immigrants. So how do these two different perspectives on immigration, the Chinese Exclusion Act on one hand, and the celebratory Ellis Island story on the other hand fit together? Well, in reality, the United States has always had a complicated and controversial relationship to immigration, particularly in regards to people of color who come to stay. Not all immigrants were equally welcome to America's shores, and not all immigrants were allowed to become US citizens and to achieve the American dream. Next slide. The Angel Island Immigration Station, which is a national historic landmark in San Francisco Bay, helps us to tell this more complicated history. It also helps us to answer a very essential and timely question. Is the United States a nation of immigrants that welcomes the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free? Or is it a gatekeeping nation that builds fences and detention centers to keep out aliens that it deems undesirable, dangerous, or unfit to become Americans. Well, the Angel Island story tells us that the United States is both of these things. Throughout American history, it has simultaneously welcomed some while restricting and excluding others. 
which America immigrants encountered at Angel Island was determined by international relations, by the histories of colonialism, and US immigration policies that discriminated against individuals on the basis of their race, class, gender, and nationality. Next slide. Now from 1910 to 1930, San Francisco and Angel Island Immigration Station served as an entry point for over half a million people from 80 countries around the world listed at the bottom of this map. Next slide. Two thirds of the newcomers came from China and Japan, but there were also immigrants from other Asian countries, European countries, from Latin America, the Pacific Islands, Australia, and New Zealand. While Angel Island Immigration Station was called the Ellis Island of the West, the station there, in fact, was very different from its counterpart in New York. It was built in 1910 using Ellis Island as the model, and that's why it was called the Ellis Island of the West. Because Ellis Island was mainly a processing center for European immigrants, and it enforced American immigration laws that restricted but did not exclude European immigrants. In fact, one of the goals of Ellis Island was to begin the process of turning European immigrants into naturalized American citizens. Angel Island, on the other hand, was the main port of entry for Asian immigrants, and as such, it enforced immigration policies that excluded Asians and barred them from becoming naturalized citizens. Most European immigrants were processed through Ellis Island within a few hours, or at most they were detained for a few days for legal or medical reasons. While Asian immigrants on Angel Island were thoroughly investigated and often deten detained for days and weeks at a time. And in the case of the Chinese who were uh, filing appeals on exclusion decisions, a substantial number stayed at Angel Island for months. The longest was two years, waiting for their appeals to go through so that they can enter the country. Next slide. The fates of the immigrants when they arrived on Angel Island were in the hands of these immigration stations inspectors, clerks, and interpreters. The self-proclaimed gatekeepers decided who would be admitted and who would be excluded based on immigration laws at the time. And they were flawed, and that's why they discriminated against certain groups. Most of the immigration service employees were diligent and fair-minded. But some had, own, had their own prejudices, and they gave certain groups of immigrants a harder time. I, re I remember interviewing two of the immigration inspectors back in the 1970s. And they said they didn't agree with the laws, but their job was to enforce the laws. And so they tried to give every immigrant who appeared before them to be admitted or to be deported um, every chance to prove his, real, his or her real identity and legal right to enter. Next slide. Until recently, Angel Island's history has focused almost exclusively on the Chinese immigrant experience. And this has made sense for a number of reasons. After all, the motivation to build the immigration station in 1910 was largely grounded on the country's need to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. But in spite of this Exclusion Act, thousands of Chinese immigrants found ways to come to the United States, posed as paper sons, paper daughters, and even paper wives. These were the two groups who were exempt, and these were sons, daughters, and wives of merchants and US citizens, because these were the two groups of immigrants who were exempt from the, uh, from the Exclusion Act. And they circumvented the Exclusion Act then uh, that they thought was unjust and, and oppressive with false identities, with false papers, and with false relationships. So it's quite true, the first to be excluded the Chinese were the first illegal immigrants. And I am a product from that history. My father came as a paper son, um, and uh, he bought papers uh, because he was 
not of the merchant in U.S. citizen class himself, and coming as a peasant in 1921, you know, one of the few ways he could come was to buy papers to say he was the son of a Chinese merchant. And he was detained at Angel Island and interrogated. Um, and fortunately for him, he answered the questions correctly and was able to land within two months. But that was very typical of 80% of the Chinese immigrants coming during the exclusion period to Angel Island. Next slide. And so when these Chinese immigrants arrived in the United States at Angel Island, they met immigration officials who were intent on enforcing exclusion laws. And Chinese immigrants were first singled out for very invasive and humiliating physical examinations to check to make sure they didn't have any of the contagious diseases like hookworm or trachoma or TB that could get them deported. But they also did these um, had them stripped naked and did close examination of their body parts to see if they were really the age that they claimed to be according to their immigration papers. Um, and only Chinese were subjected to that kind of intense um, medical examination. And if they could pass that examination, next slide, they would move on and have to endure long and intense interrogations about very minute details regarding their family history and background and their village life um, in order to verify their identities. They were asked questions like, um, how many houses in the village where you lived? Who lived in the second house in the fourth row? How far is it from your house and how do you get to the marketplace? How many times did your uh, father write the family and send money home? Um, these kinds of questions were asked also of their witnesses, so it's a cross-examination. And if there were discrepancies between your answers and the answers of your sponsors or witnesses, then they would not believe that you said you are who you, you are, and those discrepancies could lead to deportation. And only again, the Chinese were subjected to that kind of grilling uh, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Next slide. So because of this uh, process for the Chinese, they made up the overwhelming majority of detainees at the immigration station. 70% of Chinese, de uh, 70 of detainees were Chinese at any one time. And their average stay was much longer than for other immigrants. They had to at least wait two to three weeks to even be called in for interrogation. And so majority of them had to stay for that long, locked up in detention barracks that were deemed overcrowded, unsanitary, and unsafe by health inspectors. Now they failed the interrogation, and the Chinese were very adept at doing this. They could hire attorneys to represent them and appeal that um, exclusion decision to the higher courts in DC all the way up to the Supreme Court if they uh, had to. And in which case, while they're waiting for their court cases to make it, take the circuit and get, um, um, get them admitted, they stayed locked up on Angel Island. And that could often last between a few months to as long as two years, waiting for their appeals to go through. And it's, next slide. And it is those immigrants, those Chinese immigrants, who stayed such long times confined in Angel Island, waiting for their cases to go wind its way through the court system, they were the ones who had the time and the motivation to write and carve these Chinese poems into the barrack walls that spoke to their anger, to their frustration, and to their despair at being so confined and poorly treated at Angel Island. Detained in this wooden house for several tens of days, it is all because of the exclusion law which implicates me. It's a pity, heroes have no way of exercising their prowess. I can only await the word so that I can snap Jew's whip. The second stanza reads, from now on, this person's leaving, from now on I'm departing far from this building. All of my fellow villagers are rejoicing with me. Don't say that everything within is Western styled. Even if it is built of jade, it has turned into a cage. I'd like to tell you a story about Li Pui Yao, an example of some of the Chinese immigrants who were detained for a long, long time at Angel Island. She came to America in 1939, and she came posed as the daughter of a US citizen. And she failed the interrogation because her answers did not match those of her paper father. 
And so she was excluded and she was slated for deportation. She was locked up on Adron for 12 months because her family insisted on hiring an attorney to try to help her appeal the decision and get her into the country. And the lawyer went from one appeal to another, beginning with the immigration department in DC, then moving on to the district court, and then moving on to the circuit court, and then all the way to the US Supreme Court. And that's why it took 20 months. And in the end, she, she was still, she didn't win her appeal. And they thought, well, 1940, uh, war has broken out. Japan had attacked China. There's no way that they're gonna send anyone back across the Pacific Ocean, but they did. And so she was deported in 1940, in December 1940, back to Hong Kong. But Li Puyao persevered, and she found a way to come back to the United States in 1947 as a war bride under the War Brides Act. She married a Chinese American who served in the war and became a naturalized US citizen. And then she spent the rest of her life, she and her husband operated a grocery store in San Francisco, and they raised four children, and they invested wisely, she invested wisely in real estate, and lived to be 80 years old. And she probably, you know, she, when we interviewed her, she, I remember she saying, day in and day out, eat and sleep. Many people cried. I must have cried a bowl full of tears at Angel Island. It was so pitiful. So, the 100,000 Chinese immigrants who were processed to Angel Island were the largest group at the immigration station. The second largest group would be the Japanese immigrants, 85,000 of them, including 10,000 picture brides, um, came through Angel Island. But in contrast to the Chinese, they had an easier time in terms of the whole interrogation process and also in terms of their short stays at Angel Island. Now that was because Japan was a growing imperial power and had earned a diplomatic respect of the United States. And they were able to negotiate a gentleman's agreement that would allow Japan to regulate immigration to the United States. And whereas Japanese uh, laborers, according to the gentleman's agreement, were still allowed to send for their wives, so you had picture brides and wives coming um, even after the gentleman's agreement was signed, Chinese laborers were not allowed by the Exclusion Act to send for their wives and their children. Next slide. So Japanese immigrants would come armed with these passports issued by the Japanese government, and they would have these marriage and also birth certificates to prove their right to immigrate. And the majority of them would then be admitted within one to two days. Similar to the immigrants at Ellis Island and other European immigrants coming through Angel Island, they had the shortest time uh, confined at Angel Island. They also had the lowest deportation rates of all the immigrant groups, including European immigrants, uh, at Angel Island. And it wasn't until 1924 that the Japanese immigration came to a, a stop because of the Immigration Act of 1924, which is known as the Anti-Japanese or Japanese Exclusion Act. But prior to 1924, um, they were processed to Angel Island in, in much faster and um, an easier uh, way than for the Chinese. Next slide. However, there are exceptions. <laughs> and returning U.S. citizens of Japanese descent, like those of Yoneda, sometimes got caught up at Angel Island. Yoneda was a Kibe, someone who was born in the United States but educated in Japan and had been brought back to Japan for an education as a young boy. And he was now 21, and he decided to leave Japan to come back to the United States to avoid conscription into the Imperial Army. It's a draft dodger. So, at, at, uh, um, so after he wrote about his experiences in his book, and he said, after 16 days crammed in steerage quarters, I finally arrived in San Francisco. But then he only found out that his cousin was too busy with spring planting in Ochley, um, Southern California, to come to Angel Island to testify on his behalf. So Gosa would spend the next two months locked up on Angel Island waiting for his cousin to arrive to get him off the island. And to pass the time, he read news Japanese newspapers and he had his own books that he brought with him from Japan. 
And he also wrote Japanese poems into a diary. And although none of his poems and, and none of the other Japanese poems are, are left carved on the immigration walls, we found his poems um, in the Nichi Bay Times, uh, the Japanese American daily newspaper in San Francisco. And the poems that he wrote are, are, are the only Japanese poetry that, have, that we have about life on Angel Island for Japanese immigrants. And he wrote these verses in the waka style of 37 syllables. Um, next slide. Angel Island, what a beautiful name. But there are no angels here, only nameless immigrant prisoners. Tears in my eyes have dried up after several days of incarceration. No more tears of sadness, no more tears of anguish. I hear voices, I hear sounds of different voices from the next cells. Chinese, Russian, Mexican, Greeks, and Italian. Voices of sorrow, nostalgia, rage, and passion. Well, finally Gozo's cousin, um, Okamura, shows up at the station, and after a brief interview, he's allowed to uh, be released from the uh, island. And he would go on to become a very well-known labor organizer by the name of Carl Yoneda. And his book, uh, where he wrote about his experiences at Angel Island, uh, and also his, uh, his um, work as longshoreman and as a, as a labor organizer, um, is called Ganbate. And it was published by UCLA Asian American Study Center um, over 20 years ago. And that's where we found the story about Angel Island in that one book. There were also about a thousand Koreans who sought admission through Angel Island, much fewer than the Chinese and the Japanese, because after Korea came under, uh, after Japan annexed Korea in 1910, they forbid out migration from Korea. So it was very hard for, for Koreans to leave after 1910 and come to the United States. Among the uh, 1,000 Koreans were mainly young men and political refugees, but there were also Korean picture brides and wives. Um, and this is one of the few pictures we have showing Korean uh, immigrants at Angel Island. This is the Park family. Um, and um, that's Anna Yim and her stepdaughter, uh, Wanda, and her own daughter, uh, Rose Pack, uh, who was four years old at the time. And they arrived at Angel Island in 1914, and she had papers. It took her a whole year to get um, the Japanese government to issue her a passport so that she could come directly from Korea to the United States. So after a year waiting, she got her, they got their papers, and they were coming to join her husband, who was a farmer in Idaho. Um, and they were stuck on Angel Island for two weeks. Um, mainly because um, Wanda had hookworm. Um, Asians were all subjected to examinations to prove that they didn't have parasitic diseases. And if you were found with hookworm or liver fluke worms, you either had to be treated at the hospital and cured or you would be deported. So she was found with hookworm. And uh, Rose had the measles, contagious. So they both ended up staying at the hospital for about two weeks, and then once they were healed, uh, cured, the family was able to leave and um, join their father in um, Idaho. And with us today um, are the descendants of um, Anna and Pot's family. We have um, Irvin and Cheryl Ann and um, Marsha and Marsha's daughter, Rebecca, from Stan, um, here, and these are then okay. um, next slide. Let me tell you another story about Korean immigration to Angel Island. This is Wang Sa Sun and his wife Chang Tai Sun. They fled a harsh life under Japanese colonial rule by stealing across the northern Korean border into Manchuria. And then from there, they made their way to Shanghai disguised as Chinese citizens. And in Shanghai, they booked passage on an American steamer going to San Francisco. <clears throat> so that's the route they took to get out of Korea illegally and be able to catch a, a, a ship from China and to come to the United States. And when they arrived, 
<clears throat> Many of these um, Korean refugees claimed that they were students and not laborers. These students were exempt from the exclusion laws. And they also said they had left Korea to go to China before Japan was annexed in 1910, so they were not subjects of Japan. So they shouldn't be, um, the gentleman's agreement should not be enforced against them. So this was how they were able to circumvent those exclusion laws to come in at this time. But they also had the support of the Korean National Association and the sympathetic um, understanding of the State Department at the time. So only nine, and all, all but only five percent of the thousand Koreans coming under these uh, false pretenses um, during this period were deported. Majority, ninety-five percent, were admitted into the country after about two weeks' stay at Angel Island. In this case, Wang Sao Sun settled in San Francisco, where he opened a dry cleaning shop, and he became the minister of the Korean Methodist Church, the oldest Korean church in the United States in San Francisco. He was also a leader in the Korean independence movement. And his son, who you see in this picture, Paul Wang, would later end up working at the immigration hospital on Angel Island. And he would become a playground director of Chinese playground in San Francisco Chinatown, where I grew up. Next one. South Asian immigrants had the hardest time getting admitted into the country, harder than even the Chinese. Now, the, they were many Sikhs from the Punjab area in present-day Northwest India and Pakistan. They were not Hindus, and most of them were Sikhs. And they had left their homeland in order to escape British colonialism and poverty. When they arrived, they faced an American public that was set on opposing any more immigration from Asia. They had you know, the San Francisco-based Asiatic Exclusion League, which had made it their goal to stop immigration of Chinese and then Japanese and Koreans, and now turn their attention to stopping the Hindu invasion. Local newspapers published these anti um, Sikh cartoons that portray them as being subhuman and impoverished, flooding the Pacific coast with the help of these greedy industrialists similar to the kinds of anti-Chinese cartoons that perpetrated in the late 19th century. Now these kinds of public attitudes towards South Asian immigration had a real impact at Angel Island. South Asians had the highest rejection rate among all the groups at, at Angel Island. From 1908 to 1920, 66% of all South Asian applicants were rejected usually on the grounds that they were, quote, likely to become public charges. Because there was not a uh, anti-Indian um, law at the time until 1917. So, but there was a law that said that if someone was deemed to be poor and probably unable to support themselves, that would be good reason to deport them and not let them into the country. So they used that likely to become a public charge reason for excluding many of the, uh, and deporting many of the Sikhs coming through at this time. And because very few of them had the kind of financial resources that the Chinese and Japanese had to appeal these decisions, they could hire attorneys to work it through the court system. Uh, and there really was no ethnic um, religious organizations like there were for the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans to come to their assistance. Uh, the, ja the Indian population was quite small at the time, and they weren't organized to help immigrants coming from India and Pakistan at the time. And the British government, which ruled over India, could not be counted on to support Indians abroad, unlike the Japanese government. Instead, uh, actually, the uh, British colonial government worked with the United States government to try to deport as many Indian revolutionaries as they could find in the United States back to India. But another exception. Fashno Das Bagai, his wife Kala, and their three young tr uh, children had no trouble being admitted into the country in 1915. And that was because Vashno was a well-educated man from an upper-class family in Pashwa. The family was immediately landed after Vashno showed immigration inspectors that he had bought $250,000 with him. I'm sorry, $25,000. 
he had $25,000 in cash with him. Um, so he wasn't going to become a public charge. Uh, and they were only kept at Air Angel on for a few days because they arrived during the weekend when immigration officials were not working. Flashman had come to America because he was in the Garter Independence Movement, which advocated for the overthrow of, Jack, of uh, British rule in India. And he said he also came because he wanted his children to grow up in a free country. He adopted Western manners, he bought a house, he started a very successful business, and he became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Uh, because Indians were one, one group of immigrants that were allowed to become naturalized citizens among the Asians that came. But then 13 years after his arrival in the United States, Vashna became bitterly disappointed in his adopted homeland. Fellow Indian nationalists had been arrested and deported from the country. South Asians were prevented from owning land or property like the Japanese and the Ch uh, Ch um, uh, like the Chinese and Japanese had been. And there was a Supreme Court decision that had stripped South Asians of their naturalized citizenship. So feeling trapped and betrayed, he committed suicide by gas poisoning in 1928, leaving behind a letter that in part read, I came to America hoping to make this land my home. But now they come and say to me, I am no longer an American citizen. Now what am I? We cannot exercise our rights, obstacles this way, blockades that way, and bridges burnt behind. So after he died, uh, his wife Carla struggled with the everyday tasks of surviving in a hostile land and caring for her three young sons. And all of them eventually went on to college and soon after there was a, um, the ban against South Asians from naturalized citizenship was lifted in 1946, Kala and her sons became U.S. citizens. Now most immigrants applying for admission into the country through Angel Island came across the Pacific. But Angel Island also welcomed immigrants traveling north from Latin America, including those from Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, Nicaragua, Peru, and Chile. Between 1900 and 1930, over a million Mexicans immigrated north to the United States to join family, to look for work, or to escape the Mexican Revolution. And the vast majority came across the U.S.-Mexican border. But we know that at least 400 refugees came by sea from Mazatlan, Salina Cruz, and Acapulco to San Francisco during the Mexican Revolution because it was the safest way to leave the country. Next slide. Now, unlike Asians, Mexicans faced no immigration laws specifically barring their entry into the United States. But those who could not demonstrate their value as laborers or who were considered immoral or economic risk were kept out as a rule. And this is what happened to the Lopez family, Esther, her husband, Cartarino, and their three children in 1917. They were unanimously excluded by the immigration inspectors as being likely to become public charges. Immigration inspectors believed that the family had a very poor appearance and would not be able to support themselves. Cartarino was described as being, quote, thin, scrawny looking, and not at all rugged, unquote. Esther was in her last trimester of pregnancy and it was assumed that she would not be able to work. So, but she was pregnant and so uh, they allowed her to stay at Angel Island until she gave birth to twins at the, at the Immigration Station Hospital. And then they were slated for deportation. They had family, oh, they had relatives in Sacramento, the Galarza family, who launched a defense and said that they would help um, the uh, Lopez's find housing, find jobs, and uh, settle, we settle in uh, Sacramento. But immigration inspectors could not be moved uh, by the, this argument, and so the Lopez family was deported back to Mexico after three months of being detained at Angel Island. Next slide. European immigrants had the easiest time of all at Angel Island. 
approximately, for example, 8,000 Russians and Jews journeyed east across the Siberia, China, Japan, and the Pacific to reach America. And while most left for reasons of religious and political persecution after the Bolshevik Revolution, some also immigrated to escape military service and to improve their economic circumstances. Many of them arrived as refugees with little or no money and were thus excluded for likely to become public charges. Others were suspected of being political radicals. Um, they were interrogated more intensely and could have been deported. Um, but with many kinds of religious and immigrant aid societies available to assist Russians and Jews who were detained at Angel and trying to get into their country, their appeals seldom failed. And their, sh their stay at Angel Island was no more than a few days to a few weeks. They enjoyed better living conditions at the immigration station, more privileges, and shorter stays than Asian immigrants. The one exception were those who arrived after the 1921 Quota Act was passed that severely restricted immigration from southern and eastern European countries like Italy, Poland, Greece, um, and Russia. So when this group of Russian students came from Harbin, China, uh, to Angel Island in 1923, and the annual quota for Russia had been exhausted, they couldn't get in and they had to stay at Angel Island for three months uh, before they were admitted under the next year's uh, new quota. There was another large group of Assyrian refugees who had, been, who had escaped um, uh, persecution as well as genocide by the Turks at this time, and they were also detained at Andron because their quota was even smaller. They were stuck on Andron for over a year before they were admitted into the country. So after 1921 uh, Quota Act, uh, some of the European immigrants had to stay at Andron for longer periods, but were eventually um, admitted. There were also Jewish refugees um, uh, who came through Angel Island during the World War II period. In 1938, when uh, after Germany invaded Austria and Czechoslovakia and turned um, to state-sanctioned pogroms to drive the Jews out of Nazi Germany, over 140,000 German and Austrian Jews fled their homelands to find refuge in Western Europe, in China, and abroad. And we know that at least 500 Jewish refugees reached San Francisco by way of Shanghai and Yokohama in 1939 and 1940. And among them was Alice Edelstein. She told us in an interview that before her father escaped to the Dominican Republic, he wrote to every Edelstein he could find in the American phone books to, sponsor, to help sponsor his wife and daughter to come to the United States. And there was a family, there was an Edelstein family not related to them in Milwaukee who offered to help. But by then, Italy had entered the war and the Mediterranean Sea route was closed to, the, to Alice and her mother. So they had to take the Trans-Siberian Railroad from Moscow all the way to Balabasca, 6,000 miles away, and then get on a ship from Kobe to San Francisco with 100 other Jewish refugees. And this is a picture of them when they arrived in San Francisco. Because Alice and her mother had no more money left to pay for their train tickets to Milwaukee, um, they were deemed likely to become public charges and not allowed into the country. And they were uh, detained on Angel Island, but only for three days while they waited for their sponsor to send them money uh, for the train tickets. Um, and she said in her interview that um, the staff at Angel Island treated her and her mother very kindly. She had lost 20 pounds on this journey, artist journey, um, by uh, train and then by boat coming. She had been seasick the whole time she was on the ship. Uh, and so she, looking at her, they wanted to fatten her up and they kept feeding her and um, oatmeal and milk every morning. And she said, it was horrible stuff. <laughs> because she was lactose intolerant and didn't know it. So that's the one negative memory she has about being dry. And... 
Um, she later married an engineer, had three children, settled in San Francisco, um, and she said she always remembers Angel Island as being the most beautiful place on earth. I was lucky all the way, she said. A great part of my family who were older all died in the Holocaust, and I miss them. But you know, that's the way it was. And when she passed away in 2008, her children sprinkled her ashes in the bay around Angel Island as she had requested. Next slide. Filipinos were among the last to come to Angel Island. Now, while the Philippines was a U.S. colony, um, because they occupied the Philippines after the 1898 Spanish-American War, because of that, Filipinos were considered U.S. nationals, and they did not have to uh, uh, be subjected to um, immigration laws or immigration inspection through Angel Island when they came uh, to the United States. That was true until 1934, and when the Titans-McDuffie Act was passed, making all Filipino aliens subject to the nation's immigration laws. Um, the Tiny McDuffie Act was uh, promised independence to the Philippines um, in 10 years. Uh, that in the process, it was used as a way to change the uh, legal status of Filipinos from, um, from nationals to aliens. So between 1934 and 1940, at least we think 1,000 Filipinos were detained at Angel Island, but for very short periods of time. They were either waiting to be admitted into the country for the first time as new immigrants, or they were returning immigrants who were waiting um, to get into the country. Um, there were some that were waiting to be deported back to the Philippines as a result of the repatriation campaign during the Depression that targeted particular Filipinos and, Filipino, uh, Filipinos and Mexicans to get them to leave and self-deport back to their homelands. Um, among the new arrivals on Angel Island during this period was Elicio Felipe. He recalled his first trip to America in 1933, when Filipinos were allowed to freely enter the country. There were no immigration inspection, he said. I just got off the boat, like getting off the bus. But then when he went back to the Philippines for a visit and returned to the United States in 1940, things were different. The Titus McDuffie Act had passed, and Filipinos had to go to Angel Island before they could enter the country. Elicio was shocked to be detained on Angel Island for even two days and interrogated about his finances. They were trying to determine if he was likely to become a public charge so they could keep him out of the country. But fortunately for him, he had savings in a bank account, and uh, he had two life insurance policies that proved that he would not become a public charge, and he was admitted, readmitted. He went on to volunteer for the U.S. Army in World War II, and he was granted U.S. citizenship as a result. He remained in the military for 20 years. He got married, raised a family in Salinas, California, and he just celebrated his 100th birthday uh, last January. Next one. Elicio Felipe was among the last of half a million people who passed through Ellis Island because in 1940 a fire burnt down the administration building and the immigration station was moved back to the mainland. Now the remaining buildings that were spared by the fire were slated for destruction in 1970 after the immigration site became under the jurisdiction of California State Parks. But that year, 1970, there was a park ranger by Alexander Weiss who accidentally came upon these Chinese poems that he could see carved into the barrack walls of the detention center. And he alerted the Asian American community to this discovery. Next slide. So that for the next 40 years, community activists and descendants of Angel Island detainees worked hard to secure funds to save and restore this site as a national historic landmark to call attention to Angel Island as a symbol of America's multi-racial history of immigration and as a site of conscience and reconciliation. Next slide. Angel Island was important in its own time 
and it remains vitally important today when debates over immigration and race continues to divide this country. The broken immigration system of the Angel Island period was finally fixed in 1965 when President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Immigration and Nationality Act as part of his civil rights agenda. This act ended all formal discrimination in our immigration laws by abolishing the national origin quotas and creating new preference categories based on family reunification and professional skills. And as a result, new immigration from Latin America and Asia skyrocketed. In 2007, for example, 54% of immigrants coming to this country are Latinos. 28% are Asians. However, by placing an annual cap of 120,000 on persons from the Western Hemisphere, this 1965 Immigration Act dra dramatically reduced the number of visas that were available to Mexican immigrants, leading to increased undocumented immigration across the U.S.-Mexican border beginning in the 1970s. And compounding this problem has been a visa backlog that prevents both low-skilled and highly-skilled workers from entering the country to fill jobs where they are needed. In 1986, there was an Immigration Reform and Control Act that was passed as an attempt to get tough with undocumented immigrants and with their employers. But lax enforcement and immigrant adaptation has made such provisions ineffective, so that now we have an estimated 12 million undocu undocumented immigrants living in the shadows of society. Majority of these undocumented immigrants are from Mexico, but there are also those for, uh, Europeans, Asians, Africans, and other Latin Americans who are part of this undocumented population, many of whom had just overstayed their visas. Since the 9-11 terrorist attacks, our country has turned to immigrant detention as the solution to illegal immigration and national security. Immigration officials now spend close to $2 billion each year to run the largest detention system in the country, holding 400,000 individuals per year in a sprawling network of federal, state, and private facilities under deplorable conditions worse than at Angel Island. Detainees have complained about insufficient food, clothing, medical care, a lack of access to telephones, outdoor recreation time, and legal counsel. They've complained about sexual harassment and abuse, frequent transfers between facilities, and prolonged and indefinite detention. Incarceration periods range from 37 days to 10 months. The longest detained was three and a half years. And the poor medical care has led to the deaths of over 100 immigrants between 2003 to 2009, four-year period. Now you compare the situation to the half a million immigrants who were detained at Angel Island during its whole 30-year history with an average detention period of two to three weeks for the Chinese and no more than two or three deaths per, deaths per year. And we know that things have gotten worse rather than better. And yet Congress is still unwilling and incapable of fixing this broken immigration and detention system. As in the past, Americans today are still grappling with the questions of 100 years ago. Who should be allowed in and who should be kept out? How can immigration policy best serve the country? How should the country control suspicious activities among foreigners already in the United States? And at what, at what risk to immigrant communities and at what cost to our own civil liberties? In short, can the United States be both a nation of immigrants and a gatekeeping nation? Least we forget, from its founding, the United States has benefited from the skills, ideas, capital, labor, creativity, and values that immigrants have brought to this country. Immigration is critical to our economy, to families, and communities. 
and it is also a central component of our national identity. We are a nation of immigrants. So as we continue to debate the role of immigration in 21st century America, we should do well to remember the role that Angel Island has played in American immigration history. Angel Island represents the best and the worst of American history in showcasing America's contradictory relationship to immigration. We welcome the huddled masses yearning to be free at the same time that we unfairly detain and deport immigrants based on racial discrimination and flawed immigration policies. Remembering both sides of this complex history helps us to recognize what is still great about the United States and what remains to be done to fulfill America's promise as a nation of immigrants. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the audience? Yes. I thought your comparison of Angel Island with the current very extensive detention system in the United States today was fascinating. Uh, and I know that uh, I and others would like to know more about that. Where would you suggest if we want to know more about the numbers and the comparisons? Um, should we go? Mm -hmm. In the current situation? Yes. yes. Um, you know, it's great with uh, uh, the web. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of, um, I mean, a lot of information about that I, I got from um, newspapers, articles, and from uh, postings on the internet. There are a lot of advocacy groups uh, who are... Can you, can you recommend one that's mm -hmm. very, very good? Um, or I a newspaper to... that's watching particularly closely? Um, I, I'm uh, on the listserv for um, um, immigration uh, professors. <laughs> they have their own website, and they are the ones that are constantly feeding me the latest articles and the latest studies have been done about the, uh, the current situation. But I'm sure you just type in immigration and detention into, the, uh, into your search uh, box, you will come up with these sites and the information that, um, that you're, you're, you're looking for on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. I wanted to ask a question about um, the organization of people who were able to help immigrants get false papers, false identities. It seemed to me there was a robust kind of underground yes. that was happening. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and how they stayed out of the limelight mm -hmm. and how they functioned and operated and did you ever talk to anyone who was involved with that kind of, that, those kinds of activities? Yes, I can. Uh, we're talking about the Angel Island period and people coming in, particularly the Chinese, using uh, false papers. Yes. Um, the Chi you must give the Chinese credit for being so uh, resourceful and imaginative on finding a way to circumvent this, what they think is an unjust law against them, from stopping the laborers, Chinese laborers only, from coming to this country. Um, and so it was quite a, I would say a racket. <laughs> it's a racket, this one. There were brokers. There were brokers in Hong Kong and brokers here in San Francisco. Um, who would find a way, who, who were able to um, sell identity papers and, well, let me backtrack. So you have to understand that the Chinese Exclusion Act um, forbade immigration of Chinese laborers. But the merchants and those who could claim U.S. citizenship were still allowed to come to this country. In fact, um, so for Chinese wanting to come to this country, they had to come posed as a relative of a merchant or a U.S. citizen. Um, and Chinese merchants, um, the, there, there was not a large migration of merchants, but the merchants, once you arrive and you could claim merchant status and you have a legitimate business, you could then have the right to send for your uh, family. 
And um, if you are a U.S. citizen born in this country, because Chinese couldn't become naturalized citizens, you could also, you know, say you made visits back to China and you have a wife in China, and you have children and you want to send for your wife and your children. So those are the people who could come. Um, and you know, during the at the time of the 1906 earthquake, just give you an example of how the Chinese were so creative. The 1906 earthquake that happened in San Francisco destroyed all the birth certificates because it destroyed the city hall. And they had to believe anyone who stepped forward and say, I was born in this country, uh, and I still have family in China, in fact, I have five sons in China. They had to believe you. They couldn't prove <laughs> that, right, against that. So these created these slots so that uh, these brokers would help sell these slots to people who wanted to come from China. Um, and for my father's brief example, um, in 1921, he had to pay $1,600 for papers that said he was the 16-year-old um, son of a Chinese merchant in Stockton. Um, he came under the name of Yang Hing Sun, the son of this merchant. Um, and he had to go through this. That's why immigration created this big system of interrogating the Chinese in particular, because they knew what was going on. It's just a matter they had to prove it. Um, so, that, so with the, the $1,600, that came with your uh, passage money. It also came with your identification papers. And it also came with a coaching book that provided you with all the information about your family and your supposed family and your supposed village and your relationship to the supposed father. Uh, all the kinds of information that you need to know to answer those questions when you arrive at Angel Island and they compare your answers to your paper fathers. In fact, they did multiple copies of these coaching books before the days of Xerox machines. And a copy was given to the prospective immigrant on my father, and the other copy was given to the sponsor or the relative or the witness here. So they studied the same Q&A, Q&As, hoping that they'll ask those questions. Um, and then during cross-examination, they did ask those kinds of questions. And some of the people who were true sons and true daughters and true wives failed the exam and were deported because they didn't study. No. <laughs> they got tripped up with this. Um, but um, we did interview people, and there were people who um, all they did was to write uh, these coaching books. They would go interview the family, and they would, you know, prepare the coaching books. And these brokers, it was it was a business for them, but it also was a way for them to help other Chinese come to this country. No one was trying to capitalize on this system and make a big uh, amount of money by selling these papers and getting it to people to help them come to this country. Um, but that, you know, that continued between um, 1882 to 1943. Um, and that's why you still had over 100,000 uh, Chinese coming through Angel Island during the exclusion period. The majority of them were coming under these false pre papers in that way. Mm -hmm. Yes? Early in the 20th century, a lot of Basque shepherds immigrated to California. Would they have come through Angel Island, do you know? Uh, from what country would this be? Spain. Spain. Some, uh, we did, there were um, a, a Spanish people, who, particularly who came through, uh, worked on a, a Panama Canal, or came through and, and settled and worked in Latin American country. Eventually, some of them did come, make it through. Um, the Spanish, uh, we, we went, we did a study of how many people came from which countries, and um, there were less than a few thousand from Spain, who said their birthplace was originally Spain. Um, so some of them might have come through Angel Island because they came through the Panama Canal or came through Latin American countries and came around. Um, the reason why there's so many Russians coming through is because they took the route across Siberia and China to cross the Pacific. But then there were also immigrants from Greece and um, Indian other places too uh, that took the Mediterranean route and came around this way. Uh, my great uncles, I think they fled Franco. Frankfurt? Franco. 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 So that, was well, that was the reason why, yeah. A lot of refugees from the Middle East, for example, and Southeast Eastern Europe um, ended up coming through this way into Angel Island. Yes, during the 1920s in particular. How you can find out is you could do your research uh, and uh, see the National Archives uh, in San Bruno has a record of uh, 
of any family member that came through Indra Island because the Indra Island immigration case files, all 90,000 that are still left uh, case files, are uh, available at the National Archives for uh, people doing family research and genealogy research. And that's how we found many of these stories, is going through many of these uh, immigration cases at San Bruno. Any other questions? And next slide. Edward Savant. Oh, I just wanted one more slide. Oh, okay, you know sorry. what? I, I put it back to the beginning. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. So you want to go yeah, I just end? want to mention that um, Copies of my book, uh, Indra Island Immigrant Gateway to America, is actually on display and for sale at your bookstore on wow. campus. Um, and um, Judy was very instrumental in helping. No, the last. Is that just after that. No, there's, there's one more. No, nope. nope. okay, it's on my drive. Okay. Never mind. Anyway, I, I, I had a picture of the nice display you did of it's my book at the bookstore. Um, oh, it's in the program. It's in the program, thank you. Okay. I forgot, I didn't use my computer on this. So, do you want to close? Right, done. Yeah. No, no, no yeah. more questions? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to Judy Young's lecture. And the Angel Island book uh, is, is available, uh, and she will be signing your book at the bookstore. No, no, no. no you, you're not? No, they didn't oh. invite me to sign books. But they, just, they couldn't come today to sell books here, and I would have been glad to sign it. Oh, okay. Uh, but they at least have the books on display, <laughs> and uh, they are available for you. Yes, uh, yeah, I think it's a very good idea to get a copy of it. And I, I'm definitely looking forward to reading the book and use it for my class. But uh, yes, uh, Judy.